roads going on either side of the mountain and then a green sign that we have going off on any exit sort of reminding us that Ritson Road or Simcoe Road is coming up and it has arrows right way, right way and right way going over the mountain. difference between feeling and knowing. Do you know it's God's will? Well, I feel like, you know, as from the time I was young, my dad would always say the two most important decisions you will make in life is salvation, eternity, and marriage. And he goes, don't base both on a feeling. Well, I feel like she's Mrs. Right. Well, if I chose Mrs. Right, well, she absolutely was Mrs. Wrong. <laughs> I don't know where I'd be today. I was engaged. I felt like she was the right one. But I had some advice from my father going, you know, we almost had a Mr. Right in our, in our family about a year ago. I'm glad he was Mr. Wrong. <laughs> <laughs> but the thing is, we don't know. <clears throat> but one thing we ought to know is, are we saved? And are we in God's will? It ought not to be a subjective, the will of the Lord? I don't know. I asked one pastor one time, how do I know God's will? He said, well, it's clear as mud. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought, wow, what an answer for a pastor to tell me when I am searching to find God's will in my life. He says, clear as mud. That means to tell me you're not going to where God said is clear. What an advice to give your member. Yes, sometimes God's will seems clouded, but doesn't mean it's clear as mud. And you know what the reason is? Probably I, not probably, I am not where I should be to see it clearly. It's time to unfog the lenses of the binoculars so I can actually see what I'm looking at. You know what? God's will is like a pair of binoculars. With me, with my lovely eyesight, I can't look through the binoculars with my glasses. No matter how much I tweak those little eyepieces, I have to take them off. It's like sitting behind your opti uh, ophthalmologist. Clearer one, clearer two. Clearer one, clearer two. And you're like, really? And then he goes, A, B, A, and you're going, is it really clear? I can't see. You know, it's like you're squinting and you're trying to pretend it because he's got one eye closed. You're doing all this stuff. And he's telling me all these. And then he get it all tweaked. And he's changed all these dials. And then he says, now, this is your new prescription. 
read the letters. They're like, wow, I can see. This is great. But it's amazing how much one and two make a huge difference in the clarity of those words. Sometimes we need to refocus our lenses on God's word to make sure his will is clear in our life. And it takes some sitting down and for God to say, clear one, clear two. Is it clear on one? Is it clear two there? <laughs> and we got to be patient. Be still and know that I'm God. We say, oh yeah, that's God's will. How do you know? I feel it is. And so we run headlong into that devastation. God is not a sensational feeling God. He is a concrete, evidential God. He wants you to know. Where Paul says, I know who I believe. There is a matter of fact, I don't care what you say God is, Romans. I know who God is because he lives inside of me. I know he lives because he lives inside of me. There is that matter of fact, like you can, you can believe you're a purple-haired dinosaur. I don't care. I know who I am. I am not confused on who my God is. I am not confused on that God. Right this moment, he wants me here. I know, matter of fact, God has a plan for us this next month. I don't enjoy packing. Neither do you. However, I know God had a plan. I'm not questioning his plan. God has worked things out. I know that over the last three years, God has added a little bit of sideway twisty roads in my life. That's okay. That's his plan. I know that. I have many people say, well, I don't know if that's good. I don't care if you think it's God's will for your life. He didn't talk to you. That's the problem. My dad said, I'm going to give you some advice, son about your fiance. This is my advice. But I'm reminding you, it's your bed you got to lay in it. Yeah. But here's my advice. I'm glad he offered some good advice to me. Because that bed would have been pretty hard after these years. Probably not 30 years of marriage, I guarantee you that. But God gives us here's some advice. But it's your bed you he called Jonah. Jonah goes, I'm out of here. Tarsh is here to come. Okay. Samuel, here am I. Eli, did you call me? No, I didn't call you. Eli, you sure you didn't call me? No, I didn't call you. Go check and see if God called you. Samuel was a faithful, the last prophet of God. What a blessing. Before the kings. You know, you look at life. Sometimes it's not easy. But when you make God's will, like Esther, opening the doors of that palace to walk where she wasn't invited to save her people. Willing to take on the consequences because her uncle said, or her cousin said, are we not here for such a time as this? God put you here for this reason. That's the greatest thing that I've ever looked at since 2006 in May 1st when I took the pastor at Community Baptist Church. God had called me for such a time as this. He knew exactly the good roads, the twisty roads, the roads that looked nice on the side of the mountain, but sometimes he took me over the top of the mountain. God's way is perfect. He took me through the valleys. He's taking you through the valleys. He's taking you over the mountaintops. He's taking you by the streams and the reed pastures look back and go, didn't understand it then, but I understand it now. That was the will of God. It's that confidence of knowing there is no more exalted theme in the world, the word of God, than the word knowing and saying and doing the will of God. There's nothing greater. No more exalted theme in all this world to know Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 17. This entire chapter, in fact, the entire book of Ephesians, it's all about walking where we need to be in God's will. But he leaves this verse, and it says, Wherefore be ye not unwise, but
but understanding what the will of the Lord is. Let me read that again. Be, wherefore, be ye not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. The Greek word for unwise is called aberon. It can also be translated in our English term as a definition of senseless. Isn't that interesting? Senseless? Unwise. Well, that was pretty senseless. You know, that's don't be unwise. Don't be senseless. It's like, oh, I just don't know. Stop. God said here, wherefore be ye not unwise. Understanding what the Lord, will of the Lord is. It's not a mystery. It is a mystery if we're not walking in it. But if we're walking with him, God's not going to go, is it door number one? Door number two? Yeah. Door number three? You choose. You might make a mistake. God's not a magician. God doesn't work in mystical, magical ways to make you guess what his will is. Understand his will is written in these pages. Through prayer, through meditation, through faithfulness, and through his word, he guides us mistakes. But will we listen and understand where to find his will? Let's pray this morning. Heavenly Father, may we learn this morning with clarity. Use what I've put down on paper that you've spoke with me. Use my words. Use my voice. My heart portray what you want to portray this morning. And understanding the most important aspect of Christian life is the will of God. In everyone's life and specifically for each one of us. Lord, thank you for the general will. Thank you for each one of us in the specific will of God's will for our lives. Use this word I pray for your honor and your glory. May it be made correctly and with understanding. In Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. There is no more important practical question than how to know the will of God. Of the greatest significance is the recognition that his will is not man's will. It's not a feeling. It's not a sense. It's not a mystical apparition of lights and, and signs and flashing doodads and I've heard some interesting stories from people in 20 years how they determined how God's will was. And a lot of times I'm left with a face going <laughs> that's contrary to God's word. It is very simple spelled out that God does not make it a mystery. But here's the problem. Man makes it Clear as mud, amen? Not God. If we but ask in his name, what is said? He'll do it. How much clearer can you do that? But you have to, previous verse says, you must be walking with him. You know, when I was a teenager, I got my driver's license, you become the king of the world. And to drive dad's Caprice Classic was pretty nice. I ended up owning it later, but, you know, it's pretty easy. Like you're 16 years old going, boy, get to dad, drive dad's Caprice Classic, you know, velour seats and all that stuff that we had in the 1980s. It was awesome. <clears throat> Great. And this car was actually equipped with an FM radio. You know, and people will get that for later. It was not just AM. It had the FM radio and a cassette player. And this car was tricked out. <laughs> you know, the thing is, we look at this and I was like, as a teenager, man, I get to drive this clean, a complete classic brome. This thing was nice. But the problem is, I had to be on Dad's good side to get those keys. Yeah. You had to be in fellowship with Dad. You had to be doing right in order for him to bless you with the privilege of driving this car. And 
that's God's will. I didn't have to guess what day it was with Dad, whether he's going to let me, am I where I should be? Guess who knew if I knew where I should be? Absolutely. I knew when I could ask him and literally get a yes or get an answer, do you think you deserve this? That's what my dad was saying. And it would make you think going, yeah, okay, I'm willing really now. <laughs> instead of dealing with a problem, I knew the problem was me, but instead of saying, you're right, Dad, I'm at fault. Please forgive me. But he said, do you think you deserve this? Sometimes we think we deserve what we want. And God's like, no. No. But why, God? Why ask a question when we already know the answer? We already know the answer, but instead of dealing with the answer, we chose to play shuffle the pea around the, the, the acorn. We pretend like we don't know the answer. We know the answer. The will of God, we know sometimes, I knew all my life until I was 30 years old, what God's will for my life was. I just chose not to obey it. Because in 1988, in Faith Baptist Church, God told me God's will for my life that he wanted me to be a preacher. But it wasn't until November 21st, 2003, I said, okay, Lord, I give. You win. There's a long time between 88 and 2003. But my wife and I both knew what God's plan for our life is. We just never spoke about it. That was the unwritten rule. We didn't want to discuss it because we would both be under preaching. We would both be under listening to the preacher. We both know what God wanted. We were just like, okay, we're going to leave this out because we didn't want to. This is the problem. A lot of us, we don't have to guess what God's will is. We already know what God's will is. We're just choosing not to do it. Been there. Done that. I'm preaching from experience. I had the t-shirt that says, been there, done that, and, you know, was an idiot. Failure to do what the Holy Spirit says is the height of folly. When we look how it says it's senseless, <coughs> it's moronic to think about us not doing what God wants. He created us so perfect. He's given us a world that is really, what more can we ask for here in Canada? No, don't say anything, Prime Minister, I know. But what more can we ask? Yes, we've got inflation. Yes, we've got high mortgage prices. Yes, we've got high gas. We've got high taxes. We've got this. We've got politics that don't listen to the constituents. But really, you couldn't grow up in Haiti. You could have been born in Bangladesh, Guatemala. You could have been born just outside of Bogota. You know, you think about this. One of my flights after our going to deal with um, passports, I was flying back to Buffalo, and I sat beside a lady from Bogota. Come to see her brother in Buffalo. Couldn't speak a lick of English, but thank God for Google Translate. Two hours, I was... We were, we were the deaf and mute family. But I was talking to her. She says, you get used to it. You get used to the, the death, the carnage. You get used to the not knowing who's bought by the cartel and who's not. Can you imagine living like that? She said, I'm an engineer. And I just kind of just keep my head down and do my job. Think about how blessed you are to be here. You don't have to keep me going, nope. you know, am I working for the wrong person? Am I just going to be found on the road and beheaded? And she was telling me all the stuff that was, she's seen. And I'm thinking to myself, I'm blessed. And yet God says, hey, I want you to do something. I got a specific plan for your life. Oh, no, Lord. Mm -hmm. There is no wiser, no more knowledgeable being in the universe than the author of the Bible. Think about this. Surely, it is the height of silliness to have one's hand, in one's hand, the very word of the living God. In brief, by an omniscient, all-wise creator of the universe. And neglect to read it, neglect to study it, memorize it, out of all things.
legs are red. The angels, Willie must look at me and you and go, what are they thinking? They've got a breathed copy of God's Word. We have the privilege of being around the Savior 24-7 singing, Holy, Holy, Holy is the Lamb. And God gives them a will and look at them play. As I was thinking about this week, I was going, what must the angels think of us? How silly we must be. And then, we spend years going to college, university, classes, to study medicine, physics, chemistry, business management, engineering, arts, history, this goes on, English. We invest time and money to sit at the feet of those we consider to be learned and educated. We buy their books, attend their lectures, apply our minds to master whatever they say to master our life. But we neglect our Bibles. What silliness. What an exposure or a warped sense of values in North America. There is no more patient teacher than the Holy Spirit. There is no greater book than the Bible. If it was not so, then why is the world trying to get rid of it? There is no greater privilege to this side of heaven than to have a copy of God's word that many of our brothers and sisters die for around the world. Yet we often let it gather dust or left unread. Referred. I read this from uh, one of the commentators I love reading after. And he goes, he's in heaven. But he said, refer the average professing Christian to the book of Habakkuk or Haggai. And he'll probably have to turn to the index or flip in pages to find it. Ask him to name the covenants and what they contain and where they're found. You know, the Adamic covenant, the Noah covenant, the Ebed, Kevin Noah. Ask him the difference between a sin offering and a trespass offering. And you're speaking a foreign language to him. Ask which Mary sat at the feet of Jesus, and we might know. But ask which Herod murdered the apostle James, and you'll likely be unable to answer. The average church attending, now this was written in the 1950s. Think about this. The average attending professing Christian knows little about one book in the Bible that should mean the most to him. About which he should share and should know the most. The same person may know who starred in Gone with the Wind and made some. The score of yesterday's football game, or the Dow Jones Industrial Average, or the current house prices. No wonder the Holy Spirit says, do not be unwise, but understand the will of the Lord. His book, when it was written, was in 1956. And he asked the question, what do we know about God? I remember I was really good at English until I got to university. My professor, Dr. Richard Hughes, had double doctorates in English literature. Double. Earned. Not given. And I sat before him and I was just like, uh, I, I felt like an idiot. I really did. He says, would you come up here, Mr. Horton, and show us what a dangling part of food participle was. I was a dangling idiot. I'm like standing before 70 other kids going, I lost all brains. He was not teaching me high school English. He was not teaching me grade school English. He was teaching me university beyond level English. And I could not comprehend it. And he asked me one day, in front of the class, he said, Mr. Horton, I've given you lectures. I give you textbooks. But I can't make you apply it. And I went from, give me underneath that desk stand. I mean, but he asked the question, why? Because he knew literally I was not applying it. I was going home to the dorm. I was doing having my parties. I was doing my thing. I was having fun, hanging out at the mall, everything. What that English composition and literature book, and I found it in my 
book stash last week. I'm like, I'm going to put this right back here because I walked away with a C for the entire course. I struggled. I normally got A's. But I began to hate it because he put me where I needed to be. The reason was, he says, I know you can apply yourself. The knowledge is right there. The problem is the application. We have the knowledge before us to find out what God wants for our lives. But like me, from 1988 to 2003, the application was not there. Do I know all the Bible? Do I know all those answers? No, I'm still learning. But I know where to find them. Amen. It's in God's word. What will always be a problem with every human guy, including me, is the application. The time. Steady to show thyself approved. How much time do we want to understand what the will of the Lord is? How much time do we want to know what God's view? That's one of my questions I want. How dedicated do I want to be? How sold out do I want to be? All of this applies on me. All of it applies on you. Everything we do is based upon what we want. What's our desires? What's our heart? What do we feel like? No wonder the Holy Spirit says in the book of John, I will show you. I will guide you. I will lead you. But as a man, we have to want to be led. Amen. We want to be guided. We want to have that ability. God desires for us to know his will, both his will in general. To know the will of the Lord, we must know the word of God. We must make a conscious decision to study the Bible as much, if not more, than any other subject. In a general will, as revealed in scripture, it shows us what all of us should be in his will. But the specific will, in particular, decision and life of a Christian. My particular will is God has called me to preach the gospel. Period. My general will is God, well, we're going to be going into them. It's going to be a two-part series. Because I want you to understand, this is not something we want to rush through and go, hey, this is the will. Just like training our horses. They have their will at a very big, strong 1,200-pound will. <laughs> but we have to show them what our will is. So that both of us are safe. Because a horse has a fight or flight syndrome. And when they fly, they lose all sense of brains. They'll go through fences. They'll go through forests. They'll, they'll hurt themselves being stupid. And they have to trust us that's on their back. That we're not going to run through briars. We're not going to run through barbed wire fences. We're not going to do all this. One of our young ones went through the fence. And trying to get back through the fence, she tried to jump a post. Why she tried to jump? I, we have no idea. But she gashed her, I mean, literally gashed herself with a big on the chest, big blade open. And she's sitting there going, hi, I went back in. Why'd you get out there? They don't think. They just, whatever reason, they grass is greener on the other side, trying to come across. Instead of going back over the fence, she came in. She can't figure out how she got over there. It jumped the fence, silly. Jumped the fence back in, but she didn't. In doing so, she messed herself up. But here's the thing. We're there to help them be safe. But we have to train them and guide them. Just like the Holy Spirit has to train us to trust Him. God has to tra train us to trust Him as our Heavenly Father. God desires for us to know His will. God desires that we will walk in harmony with him to have his full blessings. Many Christians speak of knowing God or doing God's will. But what is it? I've asked people, well, I'm doing God's will. What is it? Well, you know, no, if I would have asked you, I didn't know. But you know it's not an answer. It's like, I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand, but how many times your parents says, Why? Because. Because why? Because I said so. <clears throat> My dad said that quite. Why are we not doing it? Because. <clears throat> because why? Because I said so. Okay, that's my <clears throat> Explain it to me so that I don't make the stupid. Why?
Why don't I touch the hot stove? It's hot. Well, I learned that because I touched it. Now, because I said so, explain. God's word explains our life, amen? It explains our nature. Understanding. The Bible speaks of God's will from more than one perspective. Understanding suggests using our mind to discover and to do the will of God. Too many Christians have the idea that discovering God's will is a mystical experience that rules out clear thinking. Let me say, God's will is not found, and I'm going to use 20 years of experience here, and you may smile, but these are reasons people told me how they found God's will, through an app. Yeah, an app. Literally. Vacation app. <coughs> License plates, job offers, open doors, and other people. But this idea is wrong and dangerous. God's not coming through my Android app going, this is my will. <laughs> He's not coming through cars. It is my will that I need a brand new, no, I know. <laughs> After seeing the brand new price of a Ford Expedition, I will never ever want to pay $70,000 for a piece of car that's going to rust. But you know how many people convince themselves that they can pay that $1,200 payment a month? That's how much it is. $1,200 a month for a brand new car that the moment you drive off the dealership, you're going to lose about $30,000. For what? For in three years, you're going, it's rusty. Hello, you're in Ontario. But people do that. They'll justify doing that. It's God's will. He opened up the door. Oh, finance will always open up the door. That means God's will. But here's our problem. We will make God's will our will. Nope. We'll make our will God's will. And we will justify it, whatever reason, through apps, through vacation ads, through other people. Yeah, I think it's God's will for your life. Is it? You know how many people have shipwrecked? Yeah, I think that is Mr. and Mrs. Wright. Oh, I think they're perfect for each other. How do you know? Did God open up the door? You know what the devil loves to do? Sidetrack us. You know what the devil loves to do? Ruin you. And he'll do it. This is the greatest way to discover the will of God as he transforms our mind. We're going to get into Romans chapter 12 in a minute. This transformation is a result of the word of God, prayer, meditation, faithfulness, and worship, like I mentioned. If God gave you a mind, we all have one, amen? amen. Then he expects us to use it. Don't trust anyone but God. The Bible says don't even trust yourself. We'll lead each other astray. Our flesh will lead us astray. This means that learning his will involves gathering facts, examining them, weighing them, and praying for a decision in James chapter 1, verse 5. God does not want us to simply to think we know his will. He wants us to understand what his will and know him. Turn with me to Matthew chapter 11, please. Matthew chapter 11, verse 28 to 30. We all know this verse quite well. I've used it often. Now come unto me, all ye that labor, and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. And here's the thing. We all claim that promise. And what a promise to make. Come unto me. But I love this verse. Take my yoke upon you, and learn of me. For I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. I looked up the Greek word of Thayer in Strong's for the word, learn of me. It means to appraise one, to increase one's knowledge, to be increased in knowledge of the one, to hear and be informed, to learn, buy, use, and practice, to be in the habit of and accustomed to God's ways, to learn of. 
I found out really quickly when I married my wife, she was very particular that the toothpaste must have the lid on it when you marry her. <laughs> it's optional in my book, but she would purposely go over there and, okay, fine. There's a toothpaste holder. The toilet seat goes down. Everything. I had to learn of her. The clothes are not on the way to the washing machine. They're in the hamper beside the washing machine. And there are things that she had to learn about me. That's part of marriage. Amen. The Bible says in Peter that we are to dwell in knowledge with our wives. We're not always going to be the same. I was showing pictures yesterday of some pictures I was moving over from my other office to this office. I'm not the same person I was 30 years ago. I had hair. I was thinner. There were a lot of things. There was less gray. There was no gray. And my wife looked like she was 12. We're in our 50s now. We are not what we used to be. And guess what? There are some lights that have changed. There are things I used to like that I don't like. You could never, ever get me to touch hot food. Never. Now I love it now. Give me that spicy chicken sandwich from Popeye's. You know? Give me them ghost pepper wings. When I was old, mm -hmm, no, buddy. No, thank you. My wife never really had asparagus. I grew up asparagus. She grew up with spinach. I did. <laughs> My dad didn't eat spinach. My dad loved asparagus. Now we both love it. Guess what happens? We change. I still haven't got a little tuna fish, but I still love my tuna fish. Amen? <laughs> but there are things. But you have to gain a knowledge. Has our marriage been easy? Can I ask you, has your marriage been easy? If there is a perfect marriage out there, my dad and mom, 68 years, guess what? you got to work through problems. Guess what? you got to work through your Christian life. Problems. Since 2006, being a pastor of Community Baptist Church has not been easy. I've been attempted to vote out three times. I've had church splits. I've had accusations. I've had a 21-page letter delivered to every pastor in Ontario. I've had churches in town complain because I disciplined one of our pianists who was sleeping with another man. A church discipline because she refused to repent what's right. I got a call from almost every church in Oshawa saying, I was a male chauvinist and I was wrong. That's not love. That's called, yes, am I? <laughs> and you're carrying his child. And you still want to play with God and let him sin. And you don't see it's wrong. Love is not sin. I gave plenty of opportunities. I was probably arid in a silent caution way too long. Because I wanted to be okay. Sadly, I was blamed. Look at me. I had one church of all the churches. I was shocked because this denomination is not known for holding to God's word. We had the greatest conversation. He said, thank you for standing up for what's right. I was totally blown away because I had Baptist churches telling me I was wrong. But here's the thing. The Bible says, if I love someone, The Bible says in Matthew 18, I go to my person, one-on-one, -on -one. did that. Then I took my deacons, did that. Then I brought it before the church and had them come before the church and they said, nope. So that I followed them up. This is my will. That's God's will. My will said, let's just let it lie. I don't like confrontation because that is the truth. But God's will says, a little leaven, leaven the whole lot. Her sin, his sin, will affect all of us. Mm -hmm. There is a choice. But the problem is, if 
Bible says one thing, and a lot of times it goes against the will of God. Me. Me. Goes against the will of God. Because it may not be what I like. But you know what? Each problem, God has allowed me to go and work through. Just like in a marriage. Just like with my friendship. Just like with jobs. Nothing if it was easy, everybody would be doing it. Amen? <laughs> Why do you think I talked to somebody the other day and it says, it's joking around, it says, so when are you going to do this? He goes, I've been hurt before. I said, no. When are you going to do that? And so I said, what's your reason? He said, I'm not going to commit to anything. From marriage to job, this. So he has a job every few months. And I'm like, I've, I've worked for temp agencies. That's why they're called temp agencies. But he's not willing to get a new job. He said, I'm in my 60s and I just don't want to settle down. <clears throat> so you're afraid of commitment? Well, every job I work for, I've always worked for a lousy boss. So am I. My boss now pretty good. <laughs> you know what? It's how we work through it. If you run from our problems, if you run from the will of God, you're no different than John. You're no different than Balaam. This, this is what's important when you look at it. The word learn is a verb. It's an action. I've got to learn about my wife. i got to learn about my family. i got to learn about my church. i got to learn about each other. Have we all been hurt? Absolutely. It's hard to lay your heart on the line. But think about the Lord Jesus Christ. How many times a day across this world people crush his heart? And for God so loved the world, that's good to say, oh, man. I want you to look at this morning at a couple things. First, the Bible speaks of God's sovereign and supreme will. Turn to me in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 11. What is God's sovereign and supreme will? In verse 11 of chapter 1, In whom also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestined according to the purpose of him who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will, that we should be to the praise of his glory, who first trusted in Christ. All things according to the counsel of his will. Job 42 2 affirms this. What brings glory to God? His creation. The fellowship of his people. What do you think he created Adam and Eve? Just to say, oh, I got two little humans running around the garden. His will was to have fellowship with him. And when fellowship was broken, guess what his next will? That all should be saved. Before the world was even formed, <coughs> Jesus was already predestined to go to the cross. Isn't that amazing? That before the world was even created, I've told you this many, many times, and I will keep saying it, I wouldn't have created you all, or me too. I knew I was going to fail, and he did. And yet he created us. Man, that just gets me every time to think about, God loved me so much, he still created me. A ball of trouble. <laughs> <laughs> that was my name, G. Desel. And I lived up to every inch of it then. <laughs> but you know, God still loved me enough to create me. And when you look at being predestined according to the purpose of him who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will, that we should be to the praise of his glory. How can I be the praise to his glory? That just, his, his general will is that we live up to what he's created us to. That we fellowship with him, commune with him, walk with him told Abraham, walk with me. He 
told Peter, walk with me. He's told me, walk with him. He rules it all. What a, what a blessing to know that God's will for us is that we give to him. Second, Romans 8, 28. You know, as you look at the first verse, Ephesians 1, 11, Romans 8, 28. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are called according to his purpose. For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his Son, that we might be the firstborn among many brethren. You know, when you think of the word predestined, God's all-knowing. It doesn't mean that he's chosen one to be the other. He's created us all equal. He's created us all individual. He's created us. He already knew who I was going to be before the world was created. He knew. He knows. He knew my birthday. February 16, 1972. He also knows my death date. Not a surprise. He knew when I was going to get married. He knows when I'm, or if I'm ever going to be a grandfather. He knows that when my father and mother are going to pass. All this is written. It's already done. He already knows the last battle of Armageddon. And which army is going to be involved. He knows the father, not the son, knows when he's going to send the son to say, hey, go get your children. That's that's part of being predestined. It's all known. If it wasn't so, what God are we serving? Definitely not an omniscient one. Oh, yes, that's all. I forgot my day planner. Let me change that calendar here real quick. If that's the God we serve, we need to go home right now. Yeah. I'm glad nothing catches my God by surprise. I'm glad he's not a God that flies by the seat of his pants. We hear that expression all the time. It's not how I would God and what God would be. He's a God. As the supreme and sovereign will. And he teaches that who works all things according to the counsel of his will. We all know that all things work together for good to them that love God. To them who are called according to his purpose. For whom he did foreknow. I'm glad he knew every one of us by our names. Before we were even seen. So Jeremiah says, when I was in my mother's womb. David says, when I was in my mother's womb. Job says, when I was in my mother's womb. He even asked, why didn't God just not let me laugh? That wasn't God's will. Amen. When hard times come, remember Job is comforted. To know that God can sustain him through his hardness and difficulties. He can sustain him. Because the trials of Job far outweigh anything I've ever experienced. I've never lost all my family in one go. I've never lost all my wealth in one go. I've never had my wife, who I love dear, tell me to curse God and die. I've never had three friends like his. <laughs> I've had some friends like his, but not three at one time. But you know, yet, through it, Job says, you are my what, what a passage to challenge our hearts. God's will was for us. And that was for us to have fellowship and to understand that all things work together for good. Second point, the Bible also speaks of people doing God's will. For example, God desires all people. Turn with me to 1 Timothy. This is part of his general will. 1 Timothy, chapter 2, and verse 4. <coughs> Who will have all men to be saved and come unto the knowledge of the truth? For there is one God and one mediator between God and man, the man, Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. Who will have all men be saved? God's general will 
is that people would trust his son, Jesus Christ. And for by grace are you saved through faith, not of works, not of ourselves, not of anything we can conceive. It's through the precious blood, as it says, the man, Christ Jesus. And his will also is that he's not willing that any should perish. God's will is go ye therefore and make disciples. Go, all, go ye therefore and teach all nations. Go ye therefore and baptize in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. God's will is not that any should perish. God's will is that he came to seek and to save that which is lost. He's not willing that the one lamb should perish. Amen. There are so many, as he sat there at the well, and that precious woman whose life is so wrecked by sin, he sits down with her and says, You want the living water? Why, sure, sir. I love living water. But can you see her inside her heart? Well, why do I deserve living water? My life shall. She begins to tell Christ her life. She goes, I know. But do you still want living water? And when she realized she could have a drink of eternal life, she got excited. She got so excited, that physical living water sat on the well, and she booked it into town, and she called out to everybody in the air, come see the man who told me all that I Disciples come out with a Big Mac and fries, <laughs> give it to the Lord and say, hey, Lord, do you want some food? They're like, my meat is to do my Father's will. And he looks up and he goes, the fields are wide of the harvest. The labors are few. They're so worried about their Big Mac and eating while the fries is hot that the Lord Jesus Christ said, I'm not worried about food right now. My food is doing my Father's will. And here they come out of that village. You know what the Bible says? The Lord tarried there for many days. Why? Salvations were plentiful. People wanted to be healed spiritually. The disciples kind of missed it. But after the Lord Jesus Christ ascended to heaven, he says, tarry here in Jerusalem until they do know the Holy Spirit. Boy, it changed them, didn't it? Once they got the direction and the filling of the Holy Spirit, Peter stood up on the day of Pentecost and preached boldly. And 3,000 souls were saved and added to the church. He changed his perception when he realized being with Christ is not the same as dwelling in Christ. We can walk with God, but walking with God is different than being Abide in me, and I in you. There's a difference. Many of us, we know of God, but we know of God. When you look at, for example, Jesus left the earth with the challenge to his followers. From Acts chapter 1, verse 8, the challenge struck. The general will of God is expressed, first of all, in the fact that God says that we are to accomplish his will. Turn to Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 7. Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 7. Then said I, Lo, I come in the volume of the book. It is written of me to do thy will, O God. And here he is talking about all the burnt offerings and the sacrifice for sin that has no pleasure. But then Paul writes, in the volume of the book, it is written of me to do thy will, O God. When we look at what a special part that is, when we read Jeremiah, when we read David, when we read Isaiah, we see who we really are. And both of them said, Here am I, Lord. Use me. Even Isaiah says, I'm unclean. God said, Don't worry about that. I clean people. Christ became man in order to accomplish God's will as our sin-bearing substitute in verse 10, chapter 10, 
By the will, we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Not maybe, not hope so, once and for all. In his will, we should believe that God's general will for everyone is that we all would know the saving grace of Jesus Christ. What a greater knowledge to have than that. As my dad said, to inform the physician why. The greatest one that has eternal benefits, amen? Knowing Jesus Christ, he came seeking to save that which was lost. When you look at the Lord Jesus Christ saying in 2 Peter 3, 9, The Lord is not slack concerning his promises, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to us, Lord, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. This, in turn, entails individual regeneration of all who receive him in John 1, 13, that we are called to be the sons of God. Amen. That regeneration comes from us putting our faith in Jesus Christ. His very will is for us to have fellowship. The problem is fellowship broken in the garden. And then God gives the greatest gospel plan in Genesis 3.15. That you know what? Satan will bruise his heel, but he's going to crush the serpent's head. When that day came on the third day of that glorious Sunday morning, when that stone rolled away, We get to sing the song, He Lives. What a day that is to think about. Because of that, during those three days, he wasn't just sleeping. The Bible says he went down to death and hell. He took the keys. I can see him. Those are mine. Thank you. So that Paul can write, Oh, death, where is that sin? Grave, where is that victory? When we see the grave, none of that holds any appeal to me. Because when they say I'm dead, don't believe them. That's just my body laying there. I'm very much alive, sitting at the feet of Jesus. This week, a dear preacher friend of ours went home to be with the Lord. He's been here. He's preached with us. He's been a part of our church in many ways over the last 20 years. But what a preacher he was. But the Lord called him home. You know, when you think about this, that's just his body. As his son says, his son's pastoring the church that he was pastoring before, says, Dad's not gone. He just relocated. Yeah. <laughs> you know what? That's the thing we look at. They're not gone. They're relocated. <coughs> and he said he's probably singing and shouting at the feet of Jesus. What a day that will be. All because God's general will was to have fellowship with man. And when man's fellowship was broken, he set a way to repair that fellowship so that we can be restored and not only be called servants, but sons of God. Amen? Amen. There's a few more points I'm going to bring out in the next couple of weeks. But I want to challenge you. It's not difficult to know God's will. It's all found in the covenant of his will. We're, we're so blessed today. We've got it on MP3s. We can have it on audio files, written files, tablets, phones. We can even stream it through Spotify, believe it or not. We can find it anywhere and everywhere. You know, as we're driving, when I was cleaning out my dad's car, after all these years, it still touched me. That he had this little nodule in his car. And I thought, that's weird. And it was plugged up underneath the car in that little USB jack. And on the back side of it, mom laid his in it. And it put Bible. As they drive, they still listen to God's word. I had the word of God in my heart that I might not see. There were times where there was a cassette with Alexander Swerby sitting in their cassette player. Then it changed to a CD player, amen? Now it's a little module. 68 years later, they're still listening to God's word. You know, the thing is, as we look through life, God's word should always still be important to us. 
It is the very book and the words of our Savior. The older we get, the more we ought to desire to know him. As we grow in the Lord, it ought to be our heart's way to get closer and closer to him. Because you know why? We're getting closer and closer to be with him. We ought to be closer and closer to know him. Amen. Our desire, God wants us to know him, to learn of him, to understand what is wrong. Don't be silly as I was. Don't be silly as many people who came to this church to explain God's will was found on that. Or someone else. Or this. Or an open door. You know the devil can open doors? Heck, I know. I've walked through them. Be careful. We've all, we can all honestly say with sadness, we've all walked through an open door we thought was God's will. I've made some financial decisions bad because I walked through doors that opened. I've made some personal decisions that were bad because the door opened. And just because the door opened doesn't mean you're not going to get in. Ask God. Knock on the right doors, amen? amen? Seek with the right God. He'll open up the right doors. Amen. And he'll close them. Just because something looks too good to be true, it probably is. There's nothing perfect. He will help us through trouble. He will help us through mountains. And maybe in the next couple of weeks I'll be able to show you the screen to show you sometimes it's up over the mountaintops. In the last few weeks, my wife and I and the kids hiked around that. Going up was difficult. Coming back down, Elaine and I were flying. It was easy. Going downhill was great. But going uphill, this little fat chubby fellow was having trouble. <laughs> But you know, the thing is, but to get to the destination <coughs> is truly breathtaking. To sit there and look at God's creation going, wow. Can you imagine when we get to our destination in heaven? Lord, thank you, Lord. We can use your life. Through the ups, through the downs. Through the rocky, through the smooth. You've been there all the way. God's will is not always easy. Thank you for your will. Thank you for your way. For it is designed for all of us to enjoy the splendor of life. Even in the midst of difficulties, even in the midst of troubles, Lord, we ourselves make a mess of your will. And Lord, help us to never deceive ourselves to believe that outside of your word is found in God's will. May we look to you for guidance, for deliverance, for life's matters. May we turn to you as the Lord and you help. May we may experience the peace that you would have us have. Thank you, Lord, for your word and preaching this morning. Challenge our hearts. Lord, if there is people here online or in person this morning, especially in person, who are struggling. Lord, help us just to turn to you and pour our heart out to you and say, Lord, I need help. I can't do it without you. Lord, give us the fortitude to look to you that we may seek and find your will. Give us the strength to climb that mountain. Give us the strength to be in that valley, wherever you'd have us be. May we not run from your will, but run to you. And help us through the times that we're suffering, experiencing, or the challenges ahead we haven't yet come. Thank you for all you've done for us. Thank you for being our guide and Savior. And as Job said, our redeemer. Use this word. Help us ponder and meditate upon this week. Help us to take what we've heard, study the scriptures, learn it, that we may draw closer to you and be better known. Thank you for all you've done and all that you're going to do. In Jesus' precious and wonderful name, amen. Thank you so much for being here this morning. And we'll ask you to look forward to seeing each and every one of you.
tonight at 4 30 for prayer and five o'clock for worship. It's going to be on the life of John. Or less than a great afternoon.